Welcome to this episode of Mentors at Your Benchside, a podcast giving you advice, tips and tools for getting the most out of your research. I'm Thomas Warwick and today I'll be talking to you about handling strong acids in the lab. Acids are common and essential chemicals in any research laboratory. Doubtless you use them to adjust the pH of your solutions, clean glassware and calibrate your instruments. But how do you handle and dispose of acids safely? And what are the strongest acids you may need to handle during your research career? In this episode, we'll answer those questions. By the end, you should be clued in on some specific strong acids and more confident with the routine handling of common and exotic strong acids. But first, a few important safety notices. The chemicals discussed in this episode are extremely dangerous. They will cause severe burns and are toxic by inhalation. There is also a risk of explosion if the preparation procedures are performed in the incorrect order. So, before starting any work, please generate or read and sign risk assessments for all procedures, generate or read and sign cost forms for all chemicals, inform your safety officer if these procedures are new to your lab, if possible, have somebody demonstrate the process first, perform all your work in a functioning fume hood, prepare only as much acid as you need, and wear butyl gloves or double up on nitrile ones, and wear safety glasses and a lab coat. Never lift anything up to your face to label it. Never leave anything unlabeled. And never carry out work unsupervised the first time around. And always place sticky labels near receptacles or on the fume hood. Always dispose of waste safely and correctly, and we'll come to this later. And always seek advice if you're unsure. Incidentally, I try and keep my hands well above the apertures of glassware and bottles so that I don't accidentally pour acid on my hands or wrists. This means not holding measuring cylinders while you pour liquid into them. This takes a steady pair of hands and another skill, pouring liquid from wide apertures into narrow ones without spilling a drop. Do practice this at some point because it's a valuable lab skill and life skill. For example, you can pour a glass of wine back into its bottle. Please do whatever feels comfortable for you, however. And lastly, this episode is not a risk assessment. Respect these chemicals and the safety of yourself and your colleagues. Let's get into it. Hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid, or HCl, is your ready salted, happy shopper acid. You'll use it for all sorts in the lab, including adjusting the pH of solutions and buffers, regenerating cation exchange resins, and cleaning glassware. Fortunately, you don't need to prepare HCl in its most concentrated form, as you can just buy it straight from your solvent store or online. The most common reason you'll need to handle HCl is when you prepare 5 molar HCl for your lab to adjust the pH of solutions. Let's go through how to do this. Firstly, however, here are a few key facts. HCl is usually sold at 37%. This equates to approximately 12 molar. And at this concentration, it's called fuming HCl. To prepare 5 molar HCl, the dilution ratio we need is 5 over 12, which equals 0.416. So we need 0.416 parts fuming HCl and 0.584 parts water to generate 5 molar HCl. In simple, lab friendly terms, this means diluting 42 millilitres of fuming HCl into 58 millilitres of water to generate 100 millilitres of our final 5 molar HCl solution. Here's how to do this step by step add 35 millilitres of deionized water to a Pyrex beaker and get it stirring gently. Then, using the capacitive effect, slowly add 42 millilitres of fuming HCl. Allow the fumes to clear before each addition and don't allow the water to boil. And then bring the final volume to 100 ml with the ionized water. How to dispose of HCl safely. Check your local rules first, but here's what I do. I either neutralize it with sodium carbonate or soda crystals, or pour it down the sink with copious amounts of water. And if you dissolve something toxic in it, be sure to sign it out as corrosive waste. Nitric acid. Nitric acid, or HNO3, is another aggressive acid that's probably knocking around in your lab. It's the one used to make bombs like TNT, fertilizers like ammonium nitrate. Its laboratory uses include dissolving standards and samples for ICPMS, nitration of organic compounds, and cleaning glassware and ceramics. Like HCl, you don't need to mess around preparing nitric acid. It's available in several grades. 70% nitric acid is concentrated or technical grade. It's mainly used for cleaning. 90% nitric acid 
is yellow fuming grade. It's used to manufacture fertilizer. 98% nitric acid is fuming grade. It's used to manufacture rocket fuel. 70% nitric acid or less is what you will have in your lab. Thankfully, you don't need to worry about the other grades. How to dispose of nitric acid safely? It's simple. Dispose of it in line with your local lab rules or exactly how I said to dispose of hydrochloric acid. Aqua regia. Now let's move on to the more interesting, exotic and dangerous stuff. Aqua regia is Latin for royal water. It takes this name because it can dissolve precious metals such as gold and platinum. It's a three to one mixture of fuming 37% HCl and concentrated 70% nitric acid. It has many uses, including cleaning metal contaminated glassware, cleaning other stubborn chemical contaminations, cleaning crucibles for thermogravimetric analysis, cleaning NMR tubes, dissolving standards and samples for ICPMS, and etching of glassware. Its application as a cleaning agent is obviously related to its ability to dissolve stubborn, insoluble species. For this reason, it's a great help to know how to prepare aqua regia confidently and safely, especially if you hold a senior or technical position. How to prepare aqua regia in the lab. A few things to note from the get-go include Always use Pyrex receptacles. Aqua regia can dissolve some plastics. Never seal any receptacles containing aqua regia. Never store aqua regia. Prepare it fresh for every use. And finally, have your final volume divisible by four. The reason for this final point is the three to one preparation radio. You don't need to be super accurate. The nearest milliliter or so will do. So having a volume divisible by four cuts out unnecessary pipetting steps, which all add risk. It means you can just fill measuring cylinders up to the major denominations. Think 30 and 10 milliliters, or 45 and 15 milliliters, and so on. Here's what I do to prepare aqua regia safely in the lab. 1. Decant three parts fuming HCl into one measuring cylinder and one part concentrated nitric acid into another measuring cylinder. Use two different sized measuring cylinders to avoid mixing them up. 2. Place a clean Pyrex beaker onto a heat proof mat in a fume cupboard. Pour the fuming HCl into the beaker. Three, slowly add the concentrated nitric acid to the fuming HCl and never the other way around. Four, use the aqua regia immediately as per your intended application. Regarding steps one and three, this is because HCl and HNO3 react to form nitrous chloride, chlorine gas, and some water. The chlorine glass is liberated immediately upon mixing, and nitrosyl chloride breaks down into nitric oxide and more chlorine gas. All of these products are toxic. If we dump hydrochloric acid onto the entire volume of nitric acid all at once, all these nasty products are liberated immediately and potentially explosively. If instead we slowly add the nitric acid to the hydrochloric acid, the reaction proceeds gently. Excess heat is allowed to dissipate, and toxic gases evolve gradually. The evolution of toxic glasses is also why we never store aqua regia and especially don't prepare it in a sealed receptacle. Because what happens when gases build up in a sealed bottle? It explodes. And explosions due to mishandling of aqua regia have happened. Regarding step four, aqua regia loses its potency over time, although it's still wildly acidic. After you prepare it, you'll notice it turn yellow or orange. It's yellow because dissolved chlorine gas and nitrosyl chloride are yellow. These gases will escape over time, which is why aqua regia slowly loses its potency and colour. If you use aqua regia to clean an object, handle it, that's the object, with a pair of tongs and rinse or submerge these in copious amounts of water afterwards. And be careful not to splash. How to dispose of aqua regia safely? Firstly, never override any local rules at your institute, but here's how I dispose of aqua regia in the lab. One, I leave it overnight to allow the nitrosyl chloride to break down completely. Two, I neutralize it with some sodium carbonate or soda crystals. Three, I pour it down the sink with copious amounts of water. If you're in a rush or you've prepared, say, more than 100 ml of it, then one, pour it over a large quantity of ice. Two, neutralize it with sodium carbonate or soda crystals. Three, pour it down the sink with copious amounts of water. The ice does two things here. It dilutes the aqua regia as it melts and it takes up the heat of dilution that is generated when aqua regia is diluted. 
leaving it overnight, allowing the nitrosyl chloride to break down this tantum out to converting it back into HCl. You'll notice it will have lost most of its yellow colour. Not exactly safe, but it's still an improvement. And if you use aquaregia to dissolve significant amounts of toxic chemicals, such as heavy metals, neutralise it and sign it out as hazardous waste as per the rules of your local institute. Now let's move on to something even more acidic, piranha solution. A dreadful chemical should be named as such. It doesn't benefit anybody referring to dangerous species by pompous names like aquaregia. I'd wager reagents called something like slow death solution or granule granules are more likely to be handled with more care than those with lofty names like angelic acid. That said, foof, draculin are both legitimate chemicals and there's also a signal protein called noggin. Piranha solution is a 3 to 1 mixture of concentrated or 98% sulfuric acid and 30% weight by volume hydrogen peroxide. Thankfully, it isn't as widely used as aquaregia. Its main uses include removing trace amounts of organic matter from glassware and glassware etching. And when I say trace, I mean trace. Piranha solution reacts violently with organic matter and will begin to boil upon contact with even minute amounts of it. For that reason, clean all receptacles as thoroughly as possible and ensure they are completely dry before use. Piranha solution will spontaneously ignite paper and explodes upon contact with acetone. And just to be clear on its dreadfulness, piranha solution will dissolve bone. How to prepare piranha solution in the lab? Hopefully, you never need to prepare it. If you do, here's how to do it safely. 1. Decant 3 parts concentrated sulfuric acid into one measuring cylinder and one part 30% weight by volume hydrogen peroxide into another measuring cylinder. Use two different sized measuring cylinders to avoid mixing them up. 2. Place a clean Pyrex beaker onto a heat proof mat in the fume cupboard. Pour the concentrated sulfuric acid into the beaker. 3. Slowly add the hydrogen peroxide to the concentrated sulfuric acid, never the other way around. 4. Allow the piranha solution to cool for approximately half an hour. 5. Use as per your intended application. I laid on the safety procedures of preparing aquaregia to keep you safe and avoid repetition. All the safety information regarding preparation, handling and disposal of aquaregia applies to piranha solution too. While the chemicals are different, it still spontaneously involves gas, will lose potency over time, and can explode if the sulfuric acid is added to the hydrogen peroxide. Some things you might want to do differently include wearing butyl gloves with extended cuffs, wearing a face shield and neutralising any spillages before wiping them up. Remember, thicker gloves offer more protection than thin nitrile ones which are extremely prone to ripping. And if you try to wipe up spilt piranha solution before neutralising it, it will turn the tissue to cinders. Hopefully, you never spill it. But if you do, add a fivefold excess of ice on top of the spillage and then slowly neutralise it with sodium hydroxide. How to dispose of piranha solution safely? As I say, it's a niche chemical and you'll probably never need it. If you do have to prepare it, Here's how to get rid of it safely. 1. Leave overnight to react fully. 2. Dilute to less than 10% in water. 3. Neutralise it with sodium carbonate or soda crystals, etc. Small volumes, such as 50 to 100 ml, can be washed down the sink. Large volumes should be collected as hazardous waste. And note, if you need to sign it out as hazardous waste and have it collected, then add a small amount of the piranha solution to the waste container and inspect for any reaction. If there's no reaction, continue to pour the remaining dilute piranha solution carefully. Ideally, use a container with a vented cap. Titanium tetrachloride. Okay, this one's just for a bit of fun because the rest of the episode has been kind of scary. Titanium tetrachloride, TiCl4, is a strong Lewis acid, also known as tickle, although it'll do a lot more than that if you spill it on yourself. Its primary uses include producing titanium metal, and producing the pigment titania, TiO2. But the coolest property of titanium tetrachloride is its incredible smokiness. Open the lid, definitely in a fume hood, and it will immediately produce copious amounts of white smoke. Don't get too eager mind, this smoke is a mixture of HCl fumes and titania, not a very lung friendly combination. And you know it's dicey stuff when it arrives in a container, in a bag, in a container. Fortunately, you don't have to make this one, you just buy it off the shelf. Be aware, however, that it's a volatile liquid at room temperature and must be used in a fume hood. Wear all the same PPE as you would for handling any strong acid. It's a niche chemical, and I've mentioned it just because it's kind of cool stuff. 
but if you prefer surfaces functionalized with titania for say antimicrobial applications then you might need to use it how to dispose of titanium tetrachloride safely if you do end up using some then one neutralize it with some sodium carbonate or soda crystals etc two sign it out as hazardous waste according to local rules alternatively soak it up with some vermiculite and sign it out as hazardous solid waste handling strong acids summarized we've discussed some extremely strong acids although niche you may have to prepare them occasionally during your research career particularly acaregia which while rare does crop up every now and then in cleaning protocols so you have some reference material to return to see how to prepare handle and dispose of potent acids and that's it for preparing handling and disposing of strong acids in the lab check out the episode description for links to related articles and resources and don't forget to subscribe to the podcast to get more help and advice from mentors at your bench side.